Before we start today's roundtable, I want to give special thanks to Chexter, our group sponsor. Chexter has become well known in the recruiting industry by providing a platform that easily captures reference checks in the hiring process. I myself have been a customer of theirs for years. I use a reference checking tool for all of my new hires. However, Chexter has now released a new product suite called Insights. This new product suite is really what has excited me to have Chexter as the group sponsor. With Insights, the Chexter platform now covers employees from cradle to grave and not just reference checking. Starting when they apply, going to offer, through onboarding, then covering their work at your company and then to the end with exit interviews. It's an easy to use, easy to understand way of giving and getting feedback from your peers. Checks your simple goal to build more productive and passionate teams. Now, if this concept of getting insights from your peers regarding your work sounds familiar, it should because that's the simple goal of this group. Connecting, communicating, collaborating. Support me, support the group, Follow the link below, recruiting.work forward slash Chexter. This will take you to a landing page to sign up for a quick demo. If you are just thinking about automating your reference checking process, it'll be well worth your time. But I encourage you to check out the full Insights suite. I'd love to find out if you feel the way I feel about it. Now let's get to today's roundtable. Let's jump right into it. Thank you everybody for attending episode 67 in Let's Talk Recruiting, where peer practitioners from across the country get together to talk about various topics. Uh, everything from branding that we're going to be talking about today to how often you get back to candidates when they're going through the funnel process. Our topic for today is ways to improve and promote your employer brand. Today we have with us Robin Guidry out of Boston. We have Coley Donahue out of Chicago. David Aramilo. Did I get it? Close. Jaramillo. Days oh, like an H. Oh, man, okay. <laughs> We'll get it one day. We'll get it one day. One day I'll get there. I thought the J was silent. <laughs> and then Carmen Wiedenhofer out of St. Louis. Carmen, I think you're the first person we've had on our panel out of St. Louis. So thank you very All right. much. All right. With that said, let's jump into over to Robin. Can we have you start off the conversation? Absolutely. Can everybody hear me? Yep. yep. Great. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Robin Guidry. Um, I'm located in Boston and I work at a cybersecurity company called CyberArk. Uh, just a little bit of background on me. I spent the first seven years of my professional career in marketing before I transitioned to talent acquisition. So as you can imagine, employer branding is near and dear to my heart. Um, and a quick seamless, shameless self-promotion that Sean encouraged me to do is I'm launching a podcast towards the end of the month called The Buy-In. Um, general HR topics with a focus on talent acquisition, employer branding, and of course, diversity and inclusion right now. Um, so I look forward to sharing that with all of you soon. Um, today, I'll be talking to you about what employer brand is and isn't, uh, what components are important to include in your employer value proposition, and how to start an internal make some noise campaign. Um, so when it comes to employer brand and what it is and isn't, the most successful employer brands, I think, really grow out of the company brand. And this strategy is key to success when you want to create an employer brand that's both strategic and holistic, right? Because it not only markets how a job at your company will add value to the prospect's life, it also explains how the job will benefit the customers and how it will benefit the business. And then I think as a segue in there, employer branding gets confused a lot with company culture. Company culture does influence your employer brand, but they are two very separate things. Um, you'll hear a lot of different definitions of employer brand because there's no dictionary definition of it. Uh, but in my opinion, my view on it is employer brand is a combination of two things. It's your purpose as an organization and it's your reputation as an employer, whether that be former, current or prospective, right? So in comparison to that, your culture is how your employees think, feel, and act. So that's really the difference there. Robin, when it comes um, to, real, real quick on that, around that starting point. So let's, let's say we may have, a, I'm at a company, may have a recruiting team. Either way, let's just say I can't get their support, right? They're too busy doing their stuff. So it's just me and the TA department, maybe HR is helping. Is there like a kickoff way to, to for lack of a cliche, to get the party started around getting to that point, that, that literal starting point, hey, we're going to do this. Uh, what could somebody literally do? And I'll just, I don't want to throw you under the bus or anything like that, but my thing would be get it all in a group meeting and everybody just start putting sticky notes on ideas up the wall and going from there. 
But if you're at that very starting point with a small team, any, any recommendations on that kickstart? My advice would be to partner with marketing. What if they say we're too busy? Which is kind of what's happening. They happened. do sometimes, <laughs> don't they? Don't they? Hopefully you've built enough relationship credit with them to be able to politely remind them that they would be uh, less busy if you could fill their roles and you could fill their roles faster if you had an employer brand. <laughs> um, but, yeah. you know, I think lots of people in marketing, even if they're too busy to officially help you, are happy to have a lunchtime conversation with you um, to give you some advice to kick it off in a way that's in alignment with the company brand. Because the last thing you want to do is the very the thing that I did the very first time I was in that position, which was just say, OK, well, I'm going to give it my best shot. And then you get the kickback from marketing that says, oh, this doesn't really align. A lot of times then also, though, they suddenly find the time, right? <laughs> My experience, if you do it successfully and it's out there and it's becoming known, that's when marketing team circles back. Hey, we like to be exactly. part of this. Exactly. My first three employer branding videos were shot on a cell phone and really poorly edited while I was on the T. And then marketing was like, yeah, we can help you with those all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember those days. <laughs> um, I think... You know, if we segue that into what your first stage is going to be and thinking about your employer brand when you're putting all those sticky notes up on the wall, whether it's just you putting sticky notes up on the wall or a team of people putting them up there, um, there's, you know, the employer value proposition is really the backbone of your employer brand. Um, oh, to go back, though, you should use networking groups like this on LinkedIn. I mean, you know. That's a great place to leverage your connections um, and get ideas about, because it's going to vary by industry, right? Your strategy. Yeah. So that's a great way to go about getting um, additional support there. Um, but as far as employer brand is concerned, your employer value proposition is really the backbone of it. Um, it's a description of what your company has to offer its employees relative to the total rewards offered by other places of employment, right? And total rewards in this case includes both tangibles and intangibles. So the goal of your EVP should really be to convey three things. Um, and these are near and dear to my heart because EVPs were taken from marketing, right? Um, so first you should be building the public's image of your organization by communicating its culture, its values, and its objectives. Second, you wanna provide a really candid, self-aware, honest picture of the company's work environment by highlighting your strengths, but also explaining strategies that are being implemented for improving any unfavorable circumstances that are going on, which is something that a lot of companies are facing right now, right? Um, and then third, as we talked about earlier, is that you want to tie it to your organization's uh, product brand. Robin, around the communicating piece, so from a recruiter's perspective, you know, I spend most of your day on the phone, right, with candidates. Are there, like in the past, I've seen where recruiters get collateral or assets where they can, once they get off of a phone interview with the candidate, they can email, here's some more information on us to kind of deliver that message, the company message, or to communicate that EVP. What, what are your thoughts around, from a recruiter who's busy working Rex, some great ways to communicate that EVP uh, besides just a link to our website, but a direct delivery coming from the recruiter. Any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I think you can start really early in the process and include it on every job posting so that people know it right away, right? First thing, every job posting right after the company description. And then, or maybe before, depending on your strategy. Um, and then secondarily, I think it comes down to kind of like you do when you go in for an interview, right? You find three to five stories that support your employer brand. And if you've been at the company long enough, you can make them personal stories. And those are really great to talk to candidates about during the recruiter screen stage. So for example, at my last company, <laughs> I woke up paralyzed one morning, my spine had collapsed into my spinal column. Um, and the company immediately is partially paralyzed. And thank goodness for modern medicine, I'm all back together now. <laughs> but um, the 
company immediately was incredibly supportive. Um, I had tons of doctor's appointments. I was out for, you know, disability. Um, and they were super, super um, supportive. And so that was a story that I got to tell. But other smaller stories go a really long way. Um, when I was interviewing recently, somebody told me a story about how they had used all of their accrued PTO, and then they had a family member who went into the hospital because of COVID. And their um, co-workers decided to pool their PTO and give it to them. And when they tried to do that, the company said, oh, no, don't do that. We're just going to give you paid time off to go take care of this right. because family first. So creating those stories, telling candidates about them, and then posting about them too on LinkedIn, right? Because they happen in small ways every day. Sure. I think that's a great story. Uh, that that right. particular story stands out uh, big time because yeah. then you know it's not just, oh, we've got this feature, we've got PTO or whatnot. It's no, we can actually pull them together and we help our employees out. So that's a fantastic story that stands out. Sure. Especially if you're competing yeah. against companies that have unlimited PTO, which a lot Absolutely. of tech companies are now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I, uh, I, I was going to bring up the fact that, uh, you know, something like that, stories like that differentiate you, especially when you don't have a brand, right? If you don't have a big name, you know, it's easy when you're a Facebook or Google, you know, or whatnot, an Amazon or an Apple, right? But when you're a smaller company, or in my case, I've worked at organizations that are not the sexiest and not a very you know, vibey industries, automotive finance has been the world that I've lived in the last uh, seven or eight years. And that's not exactly uh, a sexy industry, you know, finance, okay, sort of, but auto finance, eh, subprime finance, not really, right? So all of a sudden it's, okay, well, how do we tell that story? So something like that, uh, Robin, would be fantastic. And, and to go back to something you said earlier, I, I'm 100% on board about that EVP piece. You know, I always like to say, why should you want to work for us? You know, there's tons of companies that are out there. So what's going to make you want to come work for me versus other organizations? So telling a story like that is, is, is fantastic. Yeah, especially if you pay, you know, in the 50th to 75th percentile in comp, you've got to have those backup stories. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, what, what, what you are both kind of uh, hitting on is that when you, when you have that opportunity to speak with a candidate, you're peeling back and showing them how the humans come first in your organization. And if you can tell that story that no matter what industry you're in, that the company cares about the person and not necessarily about the quote unquote worker, then uh, you're going to attract folks um, to that organization. So anytime you have an opportunity to show that your, your company cares about the humans, um, you know, you should be taking advantage of it. I think that's I think that's a great way to, uh, to to highlight kind of how we ended up kind of pitching our brand. Again, small company, automotive finance. Dallas has a lot of finance companies, so we were literally pulling people out of J.P. Morgan Chase, Capital One, uh, Santander Consumer, GM Financial, Mercedes Benz, BMW. You know, big names, and folks are wondering why are you coming to this little company? You know, over here, why are you going to this private fifteen hundred employee organization? And it would be because of stories like that right? Because what we would share on a regular basis. And some of them might be a bit hokey. Uh, I think, Robin, you mentioned, you know, using your, your iPhone or whatnot, to take a picture and snap it up and put it on a LinkedIn profile page. I used to manage the page. You know, someone would say, well, who's your social media team? I said, I yeah. am the social media team, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, type of thing. So, so it's like, yeah, I have a team of one. I post it all. I update all the video. I create the content, you know, type of thing and partnered with marketing. And then all of a sudden, as it started getting more and more uh, followers, people realize, hey, Dave's doing something over there. There's 10,000 followers now. There's 15,000 followers now going on, and he's just using his iPhone, you know, type of thing. Yeah. I think it was because of the genuine stories that we were telling. Yeah, and that's the other piece, right? So you're telling them. So you've got to drum up some internal noise to get that brand out there, which goes back to Sean's first question, right? So that comes down to that make some noise campaign, right? Which is a nice hashtag in front of it. <laughs> um, but it's good. In my opinion, it's got to be incentivized, right? But incentivizing it doesn't mean that you have to make it a money-based incentive. But it's really foolish and I think uh, not practical of us to assume that people are going to do this type of thing out of altruism. So when it comes to incentivizing um, a program to get people to get involved and make some noise internally and externally, um, you can do a lot of things. You can do, you know, just bragging rights, plain and simple, give them a place to brag. Um, you can do, you know, a three to six month formal mentorship with the executive of their choice. 
um, in the company, you can do things like um, virtual high fives if you use one of those platforms at your company or if you use one of those programs where points can be redeemed for gift cards and things like that. But I think incentivizing it is really important. Yeah, that was good. We used to do, we had uh, an employer uh, kind of incentivization program uh, in-house and we kind of would give points like that, you know, high fives or whatnot for posts and the points would accumulate and you could get like gift cards and things like that for it. Um, but we also used to put the onus on them right up front during new hire orientation. Uh, so somebody from our recruiting team would welcome them. Usually we'd say, hi, we were the sort of the first people you met within the organization. We're glad that you're here. Welcome, today's your day one. We acted as the ambassadors for the organization and now you are our ambassadors for the organization and you can be our talent brand and our talent superstar. So we would encourage them to connect with us on LinkedIn, to post things online. Uh, and then, you know, kind of like from day one, we'd set that expectation. And it'd be amazing. We would start to get more and more folks to start to do it, especially folks that were used to already kind of living in the social space too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we do at our organization, similar to what you were saying, um, we, we help welcome people in as during their onboarding and about 30 days into their employment, we, we do a check-in, you know, uh, just me and them. And it's, you know, how's your experience been since you've been here? Is there any disconnect between what you and I talked about and what you're experiencing? Because similar to what you were saying, Robin, you know, you need to tell a true story, an honest picture of your organization. Um, otherwise, you're, you're going to lose um, you know, credibility internally, and that'll, that'll extend externally. Um, but during that conversation, I also start to highlight the importance of uh, some external websites such as Glassdoor, um, you know, and that even if you're not paying for an enhanced profile, which I advocate everyone does, uh, but even if you're not, people go to that site before they either decide to return a phone call, return an email, or apply to your jobs. And so, you know, it's, it's, vitally important that you have activity on that that platform so you know I don't I don't do a hard push it's just a suggestion it's hey did you look at Glassdoor before you you decided to chat with me great now you know we would love if you'd leave us a, a comment on there uh, something just to get folks to realize that their voice matters in in showing other people externally this is a good place. Um, and then secondly, asking directly for referrals at that point. So even if we're not actively interviewing, we do a lot of relationship building and, uh, you know, direct sourcing. And so starting to build more relationships from referrals is something else we, we kind of actively and directly do kind of at that 30 day mark. Do you I like that. strategy. Yeah. Do you, um, do you respond to comments or do you not respond to comments? What do you advocate for there? absolutely respond to comments, positive or negative. As, as you guys know, um, you could have the best process in the world. Someone feels slighted. They're, they're going to go on there and glass door and say something. It's just part of it. Um, but, you know, I think especially if it's a negative comment, it's more important to, uh, to put, to respond to it than if there is a positive comment. But I try to do about, uh, I respond to about 75% of what's up there and I absolutely respond if it's negative. Yeah, I, you, I would I second that too. We we responded you, to oh sorry, go ahead, Coley. Well, do you respond to it or does HR respond to it? Uh, that's a good question. I, I am one of two people in people operations in my company. Uh, we're a very small organization, about 85 of us. So um, uh, we wear a lot of hats. And so um, yeah. as a director of talent acquisition, I will respond to it. Um, but I, and on the negative uh, reviews, I always put my email on there and say, hey, if you want to talk about this further, I'm happy mm -hmm. to have a discussion. And again, show that human side of I'm sorry you had a bad experience. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm open to, to talking about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. we, we did the same thing. I, I, was, I Like I said, I was the social media manager for our team. And so uh, I would respond to as many of them as I could, positive and negative. Uh, and especially the ones that were very detailed, very had a particular uh, uh, case or situation, we would say, hey, let's take this offline. If it was a current employee or even a former one, We'd say, hey, you know, it sounds like you know you're having a bad experience, or let's see what we can do to fix that. Here's our email address, and if we had someone's name on it, you know, whether it was mine or our HR director or somebody in sales or operations, and we'd say, 
contact me here. Let's go ahead and follow up with you directly. And then that way, anybody publicly could see, oh, this company's actually responding. They're, quote, listening to the employee. And we ended up shifting. I can give you the example. We ended up going from 2.4 in Glassdoor when I first started to a 3.8 within less than 24 months uh, while I was there. And I mean with zero budget outside of just the enhanced Glassdoor profile, right? It was all organic. We did not pay people to rate us. We didn't do any of that stuff at all. And uh, it was just that, that, that regular cadence of what we talked about earlier, having brand ambassadors, telling people at New Heart Orientation, don't forget to rate us, uh, you know, type of thing. So it really, really helped out. And, um, you know, Robin, I think to your point earlier, um, you know, it, it, it acts as a huge wheel and a huge conduit to get that EVP out there. Quick question for the panel. Is Glassdoor kind of the de, the de facto measure of brand, of employer brand? Or is it just one yes. metric of many? I think it's one of many. I, I, a lot of our folks, it was a big call center. So a lot of our people actually would go to Indeed as well, which of course we know they're one and the same, but they would look at the Indeed ratings uh, first and then they would go to Glassdoor. So it was interesting. And I think you have to measure too, right? You need to survey candidate experience and you need to survey to Carmen's point, your 30 day follow up so that you can find out if they're experiencing what was pitched to them. Another question for the panel, and this is Robin, to your make some noise campaign and what I think what everybody's talking about around employee engagement, it's kind of really getting into the tactics of it. The topic of hashtags, is it essential to have a hashtag in your EVP campaigns over, over time or all the time? Or how important is having an identified hashtag for employees to use? So I think that it's not at all important to have it in your EVP, but it is very important to have it in every single social media post. Um, and to have an identified one, whether that be life at company name or at CyberArk, it's team CYBR. Um, you know, something that brings them, because when you click on those hashtags in LinkedIn and in most social media platforms, it'll bring you to a list of all the posts that have that hashtag in it. And you can just scroll through and see what's going on in that company on a personal level, because people are posting personal things on there a lot of times, right? Personal impacts that the company has made, so. Yeah, Sean, we had it at ours. Uh, we, we made one up. Uh, it was a hashtag, this is Exeter. And it was for our employees as well as any events that we had. Uh, our internal employees started picking it up. We had people that were not even employees, just candidates started picking it up. They'd go to job fairs and tag it because we'd tell them, hey, you might show up on our feed and inevitably they would. Uh, and so they started kind of uh, uh, reusing that on a regular basis. Uh, it, was, it was good. I mean, we just had it from a consistency standpoint. And again, I just came up with it on my own I kind of looked around and said what uh, what fits yeah we we also have a, a life at 1904 hashtag that we encourage all our employees to to use when they're posting something uh one thing we did experiment with which um now that I think about it we should probably try again um is following someone's incoming journey to the company and kind of following them over oh, the, the first right. few months with us. Um, yeah. it, it, we, we chose someone that joined my team who was more social media savvy. Uh, we, we have, most of our employees are software developers. And so uh, they may be less inclined to do some of that, but someone who's a little bit more extroverted, um, you know, kind of going with them on their onboarding journey is also a really fun way to kind of peel back the curtain um, and see, you know, kind of a cadence of check-ins on how someone is coming into a company. Have you ever gotten yeah. employees to go on video? Oh yeah. <laughs> was it easy? I, it was always hard to get people to go on video. Um, I, I, I don't I don't run that part of our organization, um, but we have a really strong external videographer uh, that has has made some really good videos, and so it's been easier and easier to get additional developers and other folks in the company to uh, to sign up to be part of it because he he just makes everyone look good. Nice. I'm sorry. I think I interrupted somebody. Coley, were you going to say something? I was going to say that depending on what your company does, your marketing and individuals may not be suited to um, help you properly for 
employee engagement and to tell your story to help you with employer branding. And that might be something to keep in mind too. Um, and that is why when I was wanting to get uh, some more um, some more information about getting connected with our uh, candidates, I kind of took an approach um, on my own because I found that our marketing department was more focused on pitching our organization and um, all the individuals that um, I was reaching out to didn't really care about what our organization did. They want to know about who who they're going to need meeting at work and what it looks like to work at our organization because people don't really care about what the organization is. They want to know who, what they're going to be, um, what problems they're going to be solving and who the people are. The um, purpose. That, yeah. 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 And the mission yeah. and um, the product or the widget or whatever it is that, that really is, doesn't matter as much. So if you're telling um, the becoming story and, and what it means, like why the, CEO of the small business, like why he even started the organization. Um, everyone likes those little tidbits or even why you came to the company, like what, why that even came to be. And um, you can turn those little nuggets of information into like an aha moment for the people. And they love those stories. It's, I always did it uh, from a point of view that, it, you know, you're telling a little, a little like fairy tale kind of. I mean, it's it, nothing, <laughs> I don't mean it to say like you're telling a fairy tale that's not true by any means, but it's telling things um, in a version of story is much more effective. And it means, means much more to people because it's evoking emotion. Um, and when you're putting someone in the, in the story so they can envision themselves in the position it, it means so much more than um, reading a list of characteristics. So yeah. it makes it more like, real. I like that idea, Chloe. I, I, we had something similar. We, we had our brand ambassadors that we'd ask our hiring managers, who in your team would be really good for video? And they would tell that story. They'd say, well, this person's been here for three years or four years. <laughs> and then inevitably we would get to uh, get them to tell their story of how they started. I was an entry level person. I worked at the call center. I worked my way up. Now I'm the senior director for this particular group. And yeah. you know, then a little bit of background on their family as well. So all of a sudden you get that holistic view as to, oh, if I start here making X, Y, Z money an hour, I could potentially move into this role because look at this person and look what they've done. Uh, we used to also do that with veterans as well. And that was a big push for us, a lot of veteran hires. And so we, we would tell veteran stories on a regular basis. And so we'd get a big influx of folks coming in because of that. Yeah. I think people just want to feel a part of a team or a part of a family, just to feel like they belong. Absolutely. Um, that resonates quite a bit more than, you know, knowing that, you know, we sell XYZ software, blah, 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 blah. But yeah. who cares? Yeah. I like to say in sales, I like to say that people, people are really good at selling features, right? Like you said, we have this, we have unlimited PTO, we have, uh, you know, yeah. a tennis court in our backyard or whatnot, but they don't tell me, uh, the benefits. Well, what's in it for me, right? The fact that you have a tennis court yeah. in the backyard, I don't really care because I don't play tennis, right? So we would always tell the folks, okay, well, what is it you're looking for? Let's see if there's something that maybe we can provide as a benefit for right. you, you know, from the perk side. And so the the branding piece allowed us to tell more of that story uh, to individuals. Yeah. A question for the panel, uh, kind of going along with that inside story, does anybody put on their social media or any type of branding efforts when people are getting promoted internally? Like, do you get a promotion? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Do, does, does anybody get like, um, uh, like a methodology around it where, Hey, we get a report every month of all the promotions that came in from the HR department or system, what have you. And kind of one by one, those are posts through the through the next month, highlighting those internal promotions. Does it get that? Is it just when you hear about them, or is it like, oh, we make sure we get everybody? We had milestones at mine. It was uh, a one year, three year, five year, and ten year tenures. And then we'd actually have uh, little videos 
uh, for them. Uh, usually once a quarter, you know, we didn't want to highlight too many people at one time, but usually once a quarter, we'd highlight someone that had the, uh, the three year, the five year, the 10 year, and the company was only about 10 years old at that point. So uh, weren't too many folks at 10, but still there were enough to, uh, to be able to do it. And there was a regular cadence, uh, you know, once a quarter, we'd look to see, well, who's coming up, who wants to do it, right? Who wants to be on a video or have a testimonial done? And then we'd usually have a quote uh, one week, then a, a longer sort of uh, a testimonial, also static. And then the third week, we'd have actually like a two minute video. So it would kind of be a setup, right? Check out next week when you hear more about so-and-so in their life uh, working over here, that kind of thing. And so we have, every month we'd have a regular cadence for that. Okay, so you're applying real marketing tactics to your effort, it sounds like. Right? Yeah, well, our marketing team decided that, uh, like I said, once we started getting big enough, they said, hey, why don't you start doing this? And we said, sure, okay. So I actually had to start learning a lot of the marketing methods very, very quickly. So let me go a little bit deeper on that piece. So we talk about branding and marketing kind of to the general world, right? On our website, on Glassdoor. Does anybody get into um, direct engagement with email marketing to, let's say you have a pipeline of targeted talent that you're trying to bring in that you've identified or people that who applied or didn't get the job, the silver medalist. Do you have any type of direct outreach via email with email marketing to those to those targeted candidates someone mentioned that in the in the comments um sending out information to silver medalists um but we did not do that no so i've done uh, that before jobvite has an integrated communications platform where you can create talent pools and what we would do is we would create general talent pools for people who might be a good fit now or in the future but we don't have the open role for them and every quarter we would just kind of push out an external company newsletter to them but we had a separate column for what we called our top 10 percent and those people would get um like business unit specific. Hey, these are all the things we've celebrated for this business unit that you would be in if you worked here so that you stay top of mind so that when that candidate is ready, you're the company they think about. And how did you determine that 10%? Silver medalists. Okay. And but you know, you know, those candidates where your heart just breaks. <laughs> um, or the hiring manager's heart just breaks. Um, that was how we did it. Um, so everybody okay. who received an offer and turned it down for sure went in there. Um, and then everybody who made it to, uh, who, you know, met all of our requirements and seemed like a good cultural value add went in there. You know, maybe it wasn't the right time. Maybe the rec got put on hold and they found another job or something like that. Anything like that. Robin, did those people... Alumni. Yeah, alumni. Robin, did those people in Jobvite, were they tag heartbreaker as well? <laughs> they were tagged top 10%, <laughs> but they could change that. Um, and the alumni group is a great point, right? You can run, run the alumni group on LinkedIn, or you can run the alumni group through your outreach campaigns. Carmen, um, did you have success doing that before? Uh, we have. It, our, our ATS isn't as robust, it sounds like, as, as uh, yeah. is it job Jobvite. Job uh, okay. but uh, we basically hack our system. So it, it doesn't, it's not made to handle kind of a CRM relationship building piece, but we still use it in that, in that context. So I'll tag people as, uh, you know, alumni or, uh, a few other turns where I'm like future 1904. I, like you said, I just got a warm and fuzzy. They didn't quite make it this time, but this is someone who needs to be top of mind. And then I, I create tasks. And so I check in with them periodically. So it's a little bit more, uh, work that I have to do personally. But like you said, I'm mentally creating those same talent pools and making sure that, you know, when the timing aligns, uh, you know, they're, they're coming to us first to, to kind of check out what the jobs are now. I'll, I'll give an example of what not to do because I've done it. Uh, I like the 10% concept, right. Or, or the pipeline or pools. Cause I've, I've re-engaged applicants. My bar, I set it low where unless you were rejected by a recruiter, you would be invited back to apply when that a job that matched what you applied for came open again. So unless you're immediately rejected, I would invite them back. Well, because that bar was low, I get complaints from the recruiters that why are you inviting these people back? They're not qualified. 
And I would come back, well, you never disqualified them before. Well, I didn't have time to get back to them. Don't, don't invite them back. This is the only group I want back. So having that bar up high is, I think, the right way to go when it comes to retargeting. The only catch is the recruiting team has to remember to identify those people. Uh, and if it's just you've got certain far enough ways in the funnel process, great. That, that'll be it. You have smaller pipelines, but they'll be more targeted. So don't have a wide bar when you're re-inviting people back because you're just creating more resumes for your recruiters to have to go through. That is a lesson learned on my part. Hey, uh, I do, I do want to mention, typically I kind of do the round robin and go, go to each person to make sure we get your talking points, but this got really conversational more so than we have in the past, which is a good thing. And I, I know we're, we're pushing time limits here. So I, I do want to kind of do a general round robin because I think we're all covering topics that we, we want to make sure covered. Did we miss anything? If, if, you, if you have any talking points around brand, I want to make sure we, we get to it. You know, I, I, I want to just uh, echo something that Robin also mentioned at the beginning, um, because I had it sort of at one of my bullet points. You know, we a lot of companies, especially when they're starting out, tend to confuse the corporate brand with talent brand or employer brand. And, the, you know, they will say, well, it's the same thing. Dave. We already have a LinkedIn page or we have a, a Glassdoor page and we have all of our marketing collateral up there. And I would always push back and say, that's not telling me anything. That's just telling me your product or your service. That's not going to make me want to come work for you type of thing. So I would put my old agency hat on and say, why do I want to come work there? Why does anybody want to come work there? Not because you have this product type of thing. So there is that, that distinction. And I, I, you know, for folks that are working at those mid-sized firms or smaller companies that don't have, let's say, a, a formalized marketing team or formalized social media team or whatnot, you know, let them know that the stuff that's there, that marketing collateral, isn't always stuff that a candidate uh, wants to see. You know, that's not targeted for them necessarily. It might be targeted for their customers or their partners, but not necessarily for a potential employee. So, you know, make that distinction and make sure to highlight that. We, we talked about yeah. new onboarding, new employees as ambassadors, existing employees ambassadors. Kind of, David, to your point about why do I want to work there? Kind of like on Amazon when you see like a, a, a review or a rating and it says verified purchase. Like, okay, mm -hmm. at least we know they bought it. I'd like to look at Glassdoor and see former employees. I really, when they when a former employee gives a good review of a company, to me that gives it extra weight because they, they're they gone. They moved on. They can say whatever they want to say. Does anybody engage um, exiting employees for a, a Glassdoor review? And this is aside from, hey, an exit interview but straight up asking them, hey, we're sad to see you're leaving. It's all on good terms. It's, it's a voluntary termination, right? I'm not going to ask somebody who just got fired to go to a, a rating, but those who left on good terms, is anybody asking, hey, would you give a review on Glassdoor? Good or bad, could you give that review? Anybody do exiting employees? No, because I don't think they tell the truth in the exit interviews. Do you think they would on Glassdoor because it's not directed? Yeah, I do. I think you'd get different feedback from them on Glassdoor than you would in a face-to-face -face exit interview. You think? Are you saying you think it'd be bad? Uh, well, I mean, it depends, right? Sometimes people just leave for more comp or career growth or things like that. But sometimes people leave because there's a pattern of people stealing their ideas or they don't feel like there's inclusion in the company. And in those in those instances, they might feel unsafe expressing that opinion in a face-to-face -face mm -hmm. environment, even if they've already resigned, because they need you to be a reference for them in the future. Um, so they, they have incentive to maintain a positive relationship with you face-to-face, -face. whereas once that becomes an anonymous relationship, they feel more empowered to speak their truth. Yeah, Sean, I think we didn't necessarily uh, ask the employees or, or the exiting employees to do it, but we expected a good chunk of them to, um, especially if they would put their real title or their real department, because some of them were smaller. So like an accounting group or purchasing team, you kind of knew within 30, 60 days, if there was someone that was reviewing anonymous from the purchasing team, you kind of figured out who it was pretty quickly. So we kind of expected at least a certain percentage of them to do it. But to your question, uh, we didn't formally say, hey, would you please leave us a good review? I think we probably, if we ask them, we probably are not going to get a good review uh, type of thing. Okay. I, I've, 
I've asked once or twice, um, and similar to what you're saying, John, when it is on very good terms, again, we are a IT technology company. A lot of our folks leave to start their own businesses, and that is highly encouraged in our environment. So, you know, sometimes we say, you know, if it, if it doesn't work out, you're always welcome back. And we are very transparent with understanding that this may not be a long-term place for folks. We want it to be a place where entrepreneurs kind of hang their hat in between ideas. Um, and so if it's in a situation like that, I will highly encourage someone who's exiting um, to leave us a review. But I, I try to be very careful about asking for reviews, even in the 30-day check-in, um, because I don't want anyone to feel actual pressure to do it. I just want it to be top of mind that like, if you're looking at Glassdoor, then other people are too. And, you know, it's very important to get those stories out there. But if I, if I really think it's going to be something positive, um, I may, I may remind them that, that, uh, that platform's out there. Mm -hmm. I guess I wouldn't ask for reviews positive. I wouldn't ask for reviews period from anyone because I've noticed that when that's been encouraged in organizations, it's mentioned immediately in the review. So it just looks incredibly insincere. On top of that, I would encourage anyone when they're talking with candidates to validate whatever review someone's talking about and don't try to own or try and explain whatever you know, the culture is or what have you, because someone's going to experience it however they want to, and they're going to have their own feelings about it. So if someone says, I read a bad, I read a bad review about your company. Um, they said it's really fake and horrible and blah, blah, blah. Just say, well, that's the experience that individual had. You know, I'm not going to take that away from them. But don't, you're going to, um, you're not going to look anything but horrible if you try and play uh, that that didn't happen for that person. Just um, be the better person and say that, you know, that may have happened for that person. It may not have, but um, uh, everyone yeah. knows that some people get angry, some people don't, just let it be. And you're gonna come out the, the better person in the end. That being I, said, I, if it, oh, sorry, David, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna say that being said, if anybody listening is planning on, you know, running a campaign internally to level up their Glassdoor score, if you have a paid Glassdoor employer account, Glassdoor will provide you with recommended templates to um, and talk tracks to use within your organization that are not really pressuring. Um, and so they'll give you those talk tracks and support around that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, we did that as well. And, and they even have a tracking uh, campaign or you can track the campaign as well, if I'm not mistaken, Robin, where you can send out, let's say, an internal email to 100 of your most recent employees, let's say at, at their 90 day mark, and kind of figure out what the response rate is, right? So oh, it looks like we had 20% response rate. So let's change the message up and do some A-B testing or something on it um, for the messaging. But Coley, to get back to yours, uh, I wanted to mention also with those negative glass door reviews, I used to tell my team all the time, go ahead and acknowledge that. If you've got a candidate mm -hmm. on the phone who's asking yeah. you about it, uh, don't try to skirt the issue or you know change the subject or topic. Acknowledge it, say, yep, that actually happened. Yeah. That was somebody who was disgruntled employee or we tried to work it out, we couldn't make it work. If you notice, we asked them, we shot them an email with or an email address to you know uh, reference someone, it didn't happen. Uh, and people would actually be pretty open about it. They, they thanked us. Yeah. They would say, you know, hey, thanks for letting me know. Most companies don't like to acknowledge the negative ones or they hide them. Yeah. And we didn't. We didn't. We would purposefully leave everything up there uh, mm -hmm. type of thing. And, and it made it a lot more genuine. Yeah. People tend to respect you a whole lot more if you just acknowledge it. Um, and I would specifically. Oh, totally you froze. She'll, she'll, she'll pop in here. All right, uh, okay, another question sort of go along those lines, I think. Uh, so DNI is getting a lot of movement, right? As far as 
teams and companies, everything around it. In the past, to me, employment branding has been mainly a, a recruiting. All right, so DNI may be part of recruiting and maybe kind of a sibling of recruiting. With DNI coming into the to the world as it is, are we working with? Are we partnering? Are we playing well together uh, around DNI programs and making that also part of our EVP and part of our story? Anybody? I mean, I, I can start. I you know we I mentioned earlier we had a big a uh, push for uh, veterans. Uh, we had a lot of veterans within our organization. Uh, we were owned by, or I believe it's still owned by the Blackstone Group. So they had a big push for 50,000 veteran hires within five years amongst the entire portfolio of Blackstone companies. So that was a big push that we had internally. Uh, we had it on our website. We had it highlighted uh, as our EVP when we would talk to folks at a job fair or if we were doing some open houses or whatnot. Um, and then, of course, even from the diversity piece, uh, outside of just vets, um, you know, whether it was uh, the LGBTQ community or from different races, we would also highlight those folks in our testimonials as well. Uh, so that was something that became, again, part of the regular cadence. Got it. And I think that goes back to an earlier point that we talked about, which is providing an honest and self-aware overview of your company in your employer value proposition, right? Um, and so if it's something that your organization has already been good at, definitely advertise that in your employee value proposition. But if it's something that your organization is working towards, um, recognize that as well and talk about how you're going to achieve that and, and measure your success against it. But it is a question that um, I would say 85% of candidates are asking during phone screens these days. They're saying, what are you as an individual doing in your company to promote diversity? And so people need to be prepared for that question. That's a great point, Robin. I, I remember hearing that a lot uh, towards the last probably two years, uh, 18 and 19 especially, used to get a lot more candidates saying, you know, tell me what you're doing with these initiatives or tell me about your population of X, you know, type of thing within your organization, which I used to never hear that uh, prior to 2018 in that, in that quantity. Uh, I, I just did like a, a presentation to give our company an overview of how talent acquisition how talent acquisition works at our organization and one of the interesting kind of nuggets of information I found is that it was something like 69 percent of generation like millennials and generation z which are called the founders generation uh care deeply about both community involvement and dei initiatives and so you know you should really be leaning into those types of stories whether it's on your website social media and during your interviews because um the folks that that feel that the organization cares about these topics are more likely to stay five years or longer. I, I, I was interested to, to hear not only that, similar to what you said, David, I, I get those questions a lot more often now, but that it's also backed up by some studies that are out there. Good to know. Fantastic stuff. Hey, uh, I, I wanna thank everybody. I, I know we've gone a little bit over. I wanna thank everybody. I thought that was a really good round table discussion. Uh, all the way throughout, a little change of uh, format for me. So I appreciate it. Any any final thoughts or comments as a whole? Other, otherwise, we'll, we'll call it a day, but I want to thank everybody. But any any final thoughts? Overall, uh, I thought this was a ton of fun. Sean, thank you so much. This is the first time I've been part of something like this. And, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate the group that you've put together. I'm learning a lot. I'm starting to interact more with uh, folks. So I just want to take a chance to say thank you. Oh, my pleasure. It's enjoyable for me too. <laughs> Same. And I think we would encourage everybody listening to connect with all of us on LinkedIn. I'm sure we would all be happy to talk with you about this more. Robin, what's the name of your podcast again? It's going to be called The Buy-In. It's scheduled to launch the last week of this month. And it's about getting buy-in from the business line, right? Yeah. So I pulled 100 uh, or I pulled... <laughs> 346 HR professionals and I got over 100 ideas for podcasts, but the running thread throughout it was, but none of your advice matters because we don't know how to get buy-in up, down, and across the organization for these ideas. So that is a required component of each podcast episode is how to get buy-in for the idea. Could you- Oh, wow. That, that in, buy-in includes budget, right? <laughs> it does have the word buy-in, doesn't it? <laughs> Right, the never ending battle. All yeah, right, a lot of it's around building business cases. I'm just joking, but kind of serious. 
Uh, <laughs> thank you, everybody. Uh, much appreciated. I'll, I'll let you go. Enjoy uh, your week and your weekend, and I'll, I'll talk to everybody real soon. Thank you. Appreciate it, Sean. Okay, thank thank you. you so much oh, for this. Thank you.